for the program to be successful, there has to be executive support or C-level support. When it's too much of a siloed initiative without you know, the company-wide strategy, it's never going to be successful. Customer experience wisdom, a dash of travel talk, we've been cleared for takeoff. The best meals are served outside and require a passport. Would you expect to mix Arctic warfare and experience design and a new country for CX Passport into one episode? Well, that's exactly what you get today as I get the chance to talk with Marcus Carlson, our first guest from Sweden. Marcus brings a wealth of experience from roles that blend customer experience strategy and consulting across the Nordics. Currently serving as a customer experience strategist at SEB, Marcus focuses on enhancing how a company understands and serves its customers through an innovative NPS program and targeted research. Before SEB, Marcus played a crucial role at Medallia designing top tier CX solutions that led to multiple six figure deals across the Nordics, Benelux and Dach regions. With a background that includes time, yeah, as an army ranger in the Swedish armed forces, Marcus's journey is as diverse as it is impressive. From that Arctic warfare to transforming customer experiences, Marcus has seen it all. Get your passport out, y'all. We have arrived in Sweden. Marcus, welcome to CX Passport. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for having me. Thank you for that introduction. I, the smile is genuine. I am, I, one, I love checking off a new country. It, and then, yeah, when you told me some of your background, it was, holy crap, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you did, when we met that first time, shared a phrase with me when we very first talked. And I really, I dug it. Companies should stop hunting KPIs. Tell me more about that thought. Right. And what, what I meant when I said it was specifically related to uh, CX KPIs. Mm. Um, cause what I've seen is that, I mean, in the context of CX, the, the metric that gets used most of the time is MPS and yeah. the problem with hunting MPS too much and focusing on too much on it as a KPI is that one, it's extremely, uh, susceptible to tampering. I mean, <laughs> you can, you can yeah. choose. So, so this, I mean, this, this, um, this plays into how you look at it. So. You can choose to look at specific subset of your customers. You can choose to look at specific journeys or uh, part of journeys where the MPS is extremely high. And then you communicate that because you want to make sure everything looks good. But you can also uh, tamper with it in terms of who gets the surveys, right? You can only send it to customers that you know are going to be happy about. Uh, <laughs> or you can, as, as every auto dealership in the States feels like they do, you know, they tell their customers, hey, please only give us a nine and a 10. Yeah. Otherwise, my kids will go hungry. I'll lose yeah. my job. You know, my, my boss will stab my tires. Yeah, Just I know don't, exactly. Don't t- t- ignore the service. It's, it's so susceptible to tampering. I'm not, I still think MPS is a very valuable metric, um, but the value lies in the behavior and not in the sort of look at this data point. This is, this is what it is because it is a subset of your customers responding um, and that the amount of responses go down every year. Um, so what I think, you know, instead of hunting it and just focusing on the KPI and the digit, focus on the behavior behind it. So instead of sharing, I mean, I would, I haven't seen this, but I would love in a team meeting, you know, even in like a big company wide meeting, instead of the, the leader, the CEO of our department head talking about this is our MPS, bring up a story of, yeah, you know, an employee doing something that exemplifies really good you know, CX behavior. Yeah. Like, so a customer wasn't happy. We reached out to them. This is the actions we took because those stories, one, they stick with you, but two, it mm-hmm. enforces their behavior of CX instead of just this digit yeah. that's so susceptible tempering. That is, I, I love it when I've, I've actually been a part of companies that have, I've seen that transition from the mm-hmm. scorecard to the storytelling to the, the number is, was the objective and I love the phrase, right? I talked about a number being the objective, but really it's that KPI hunting. How can I find that KPI that makes my team look the best or make sure right. that I get the incentive that I want to get paid or my bonus at the end of the year? I've seen them transition to that storytelling, the impact of that storytelling and getting into the why behind it. It has been so valuable. And what I've seen is so much of that, that KPI hunting, to stick with your phrase, <laughs> comes from this survey based 
customer insight culture. Right. Even you said there that, you know, response rates are going down anyway. So if surveys are declining or even in many areas obsolete or just abuse the heck out of them, like the car dealership one, mm -hmm. where would you recommend a customer, a client, a company go beyond the survey? What are some of these new sources of customer insight? Well, good question. And I think that the industry has to go that way, right? Because customers yeah. are getting sick of surveys. The response rates are going down. Um, so you have to look at other ways of understanding, but, but at the same time, customer experience is more important than ever. So you have <laughs> yeah. to figure out where do we get these insights from And An example that I like to think of is, you know, if you Rick were running a grocery store and if you were able to follow customers, just walk behind them. If you saw a customer walk swiftly into the store, walk to a specific aisle, to a specific shelf, to a specific, you know, subset of that shelf. And then two seconds later, they just turned around and walked out. And then you could see that ah, on this shelf, we were, there was no stock. We were sold out, right? You would know yep. why they came, what they were looking for and why they left. And you could deduct their experience fairly accurately, right? Mm -hmm. So in a grocery store setting, we can't really do that because it's not feasible. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> Certainly not scalable. That's a, and it's, right, a it's, not scalable. it's very creepy too. <laughs> I guess he could have some type of AI solution that you know looks at movement, but <laughs> sure. you know, it'd be it'd be difficult. But instead, you know, with digital channels, websites, and apps, you can mm -hmm. do this. And I know companies that do it, right? Where you can see why customers come, like what they're trying to find and where they're clicking, where they're hovering. All of these observed data points tell you not everything, but I would say most of what you need to know about the customer experience. And then for certain behaviors that you just can't understand you can use a survey to try to understand that behavior or interviews or something else. But I think there's a ton of untapped uh, insights that come from just looking at what the customer is doing instead of asking. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now, sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. Yeah, and that I've I've heard others say something kind of similar that it's the voice of the customer sometimes is not necessarily the literal voice, the spoken right. or the the written or whatever, but rather the observed behavior is a voice of the customer. Have you found that companies? You said something there of, hey, if there's something you don't quite understand, you can use a survey to get at that. That seems the reverse order of what at least historically I think most companies have done, and that is do the survey, the mass, and then distill down to, okay, what are the behaviors we're seeing inside of that? Right. How have you seen companies sort of make that flip men mentally? How, what, what is it that convinces them to go after behavior before survey? I think it has to be driven from different angles, right? Because the surveys, I mean, if you go back 20 years ago, it's the market research team that's, that was very siloed who started doing, you know, who were doing surveys, and then they might have gotten tapped to do the CX program or MPS. But as digital analytics became, uh, you know, a big thing, mm -hmm. I think those teams sat on some of the tools that could do that. And so as their, you know, as those teams got more of a voice inside the company, I think they were the ones um, leading that charge, right? Because they've always, right. my experience is that many teams working with conversion optimization, and website analytics, they're skeptical of surveys because they're like, well, you're only asking a subset of the customers and maybe 2% right. of those actually respond to it. With our analytics tools, we look at every single customer. So uh, and in, in some cases, I think different departments have to drive it and introduce it because the traditional market that, research teams aren't going to do it. You know, that's, I, that's a, a, a view that I haven't heard as it may be ever or as often. And it's more, it's less about, Hey, we've got this new technology tool or we've got, some, but rather it's more about the human and legacy behavior that has to be overcome in the company. Right. And so, you know, teams might be reluctant to do that or to adopt that. And it's bringing some of those teams together, be it the, and I'm, I know I'm not using the right phrases here, but the survey team versus the digital right. analytics team and bringing that all together into the the discipline of customer experience. I think now that's... it's, it's a little bit of speculation on my end because yeah. I haven't observed sort of the, the full journey of such a, of such a transition. 
Like I've mm -hmm. worked with companies who have been on one side of it, but I haven't seen the full journey. So I can piece together what I've seen, but that's a combination of speculation mixed with some of the things that I've seen. Yeah. And which, Hey, the reality is our experiences are what shape our insights. And so you're right. I only know what I've seen or what I've heard and learned from, from guests on CX Passport. And you're right. So that's the experience and the insight to share for sure. So Marcus, in your consulting past, I know you've worked on that pre-solution design for a well-known experience management tool. It's that solution design that I want to talk about, because to me, that is the, the helping a client go beyond just buying a tool and into an overall approach to experience design. So how should a company be thinking about experience management and an experience management tool and then develop those right processes to create that overall experience design that ultimately creates tangible business results? Right. So I think for starters, for the program to be successful, there has to be executive support or C-level support. And I know it's a cliche. People talk about it uh, maybe too often, but my experience is that when it's too much of a siloed initiative without, you know, the company-wide strategy uh, going into that, it's never going to be successful. Um, and second, it needs to be more than a point solution for service, right? It needs to, we talked about before, observe data. Uh, it needs to probably not collected because I don't know if any of them do, but they need to have really good integrations with tools that collect um, behaviors from customers and right. they'll be able to process that data really well. So it's not just focus on survey data. Um, I think that was, I think really important. It needs to foster the right behaviors that we want, right? So we talked yeah. earlier about not the KPI hunting, but the behaviors instead. And so is the tool promoting those behaviors, meaning is the tool only set up for one or two power users, or is it really set up for you know hundreds, if not thousands of users mm -hmm. who all can see their data in a really you know nice way that applies to them? Um, does it have case management or does it implement really well, integrate really well with the case management tool so that mm -hmm. you're actually taking action on the insights that you're collecting and what you're seeing? Um, and then the, to, to your last point about it being, you know, achieving business results, you know, this is something that you see way too often too, is that these CX programs aren't really connected to financial outcomes. They're connected to CSAT or MPS and it kind of stops there. Uh -huh. But what I think they have to do is you need to be able to extend it to say, okay, well, what impact are our CX actions having on actual financial outcomes? Like how much money is it saving us? How much more revenue is coming in as a result of this? And if your tool is not helping you with that, it's never going to be seen as that important. And it's going to be something that's get put on the chopping block if things go bad yeah. and you have to cut, you know, cut costs. Boy. So there's a, lots of things, but, you know, starting at the yeah. level being bought in, fostering the right behavior, but also extending all the way out to, can we link this to actual financial outcomes, not just CSAT yeah. or, you know, uh, other advantage, of course. And so much of that, uh, I love that you kind of walked through that huh, journey. I almost hate to use that word, but from the, <laughs> ultimately getting to there, even things like tying it to the case management, these are process, these are execution decisions that have to be made. And it's not just, ah, oh, we bought a nice tool, look at this nice report, oh, look at our dashboard, but rather, how does this tie into the processes? And if they don't exist, create the processes to right. do something with it and then ultimately why am i doing this if i'm doing it for a csat forget about it but if i'm doing it to improve a financial result exactly getting to that point uh my neck was getting a little sore from nodding <laughs> with you there and agreeing <laughs> with you all right i gotta switch it up on you a little bit here and long time uh cx passport travelers will know that this is the question i'm about to ask but I love it. I love it when we go into a new region. It's an area that I mentioned. I've spent an overnight in Stockholm on my way back from the Soviet Union in 1990 or 91. So I barely know Sweden. I want to know more about what is what's customer experience like there in Sweden, both in the CX industry and simply what's it like to be a customer in Sweden? Well, the, the short answer is it's not as mature as other markets. And by other markets, I mean the United States because I've lived and worked there. Okay. Um, so. You, you know, the phrase, the customer's king, that phrase hasn't made it over here, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is ironic because we're a monarchy and you're not. Yes, yeah, I, <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> but we don't, as a, as a, 
as a customer, you're not, you don't have the same return windows. Uh, the return policies are not as generous. The customer service is not, uh, people aren't as friendly, I would say. So it's certainly a step down in a retail setting for customers. Okay. Um, now, I will say for the digital side, probably not as much. We were an early adopter of the internet. A lot of, well, by European standards, we have a lot of tech companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think on the digital side, we do pretty well. Experience design is huge in Sweden, user experience. And so for digital tools like Spotify and, and others, um, I think they provide a pretty good customer experience. But on the retail side, if you're coming here as a tourist, it's not great. But I don't know if any European country is great, honestly, <laughs> compared to... Compared to the US, you know, there's the story that I heard that um, there was so someone walked into Nordstrom's with a set of tires and was able to return them. Right. Yeah, um, that's the legendary Nordstrom tour, even though Nordstrom doesn't sell tires. Right. And, and something like that would, and it might have not happened in, in Nordstrom, but it could have, like feasibly, because I shopped right. to Nordstrom's and they were really good about customer experience, but that would have never happened in Sweden. Um, <laughs> in terms of the CX industry, we're also fairly behind. I mean, a lot of the thinking and the tools come from the US. Um, I think we're still very server reliant, um, ah, and yeah. oftentimes the, the team sits in a silo data is not typically shared that well across organizations, um, CX data. So I think we're, we're behind, um, certainly the U S but probably even some of the leading companies in Europe, uh, but on the digital side, and again, connecting mm -hmm. to user experience and digital analytics, yeah. I feel like we do pretty well. Marcus, uh, that I like how you separated that out, even though it's all customer experience, but there's, there are, there's nuances to it and the digital adoption, the technology adoption in Sweden and, and, and the experience that sits there sounds like it's ahead. I will tell you this, you said a couple times, you know, it's not as good as it is in the U S trust me, we got plenty of survey based com companies and we got plenty of silos or as you've seen, you know, teams that are struggling to even uh, exist. So, uh, fear not Sweden may not be as behind who knows the U S may be turning to look at Sweden as well, because uh, we certainly have our challenges in the customer experience, customer service space for sure, which is why it's time for us to take a little break here. You mentioned you'd been in the U.S. I'm sure that there have been times that you've had some long travel and a first class lounge is really nice to stop down. And so let's do that today or move quickly here and hopefully have a little bit of fun. What is a dream travel location from your past? I would say Rigen. So it's Germany's largest island. It's not that far from Sweden at all. In fact, it used to be part of Sweden in the 1600s. Oh, but we huh. were there a few years ago, this time of year, so in the fall. So this is off, the, off Germany's northern coast. Specifically, we visited a hunting castle in a um, leaf forest. Oh, and my. they have a steam train there that's still operating that's over 100 years old. Oh, my. And so that experience of going through this leaf forest in the fall on this hundred plus year old steam train was incredible. And, uh, I would nice. love to go back and say, cause I just want to make sure I heard it right. Say which Island it was. It's called Regen. Okay. Gotcha. Oh man. It, what I love about this, especially when I'm talking to folks from around the, the globe is the dream travel locations are ones that I've never heard of and how awesome that it's this beautiful Island just off the coast of Germany. What a fun little fact, I guess, fun uh, to us now, maybe in the 1600s, it wasn't so fun that it used to be under Swedish <laughs> control. Let's go the other direction. What is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? I would say any, I've never been to a tropical island. So I'm thinking like Cook Islands, oh. Bora Bora, Maldives. Any tropical island sounds incredible. It's, I've always wanted to go to one. Um, okay. I like I'm not that. picky, just tropical island. <laughs> just anything that's got you know, a palm reefs, tree. Yeah, yeah, turquoise water, <laughs> yeah. Uh, coconuts. That's, that to me as a kid growing up sounded like the ideal vacation, but it's just ex extremely far away from Sweden. So I've never made it. Well, that's what I was thinking. As you say that, I can see why that uh, not only because of what you're describing, the distance and just the appeal of having never done it before. We're recording this October. Let's see, look, October 16th. And I imagine that the weather is turning a little cooler. The light is fading in Sweden. So that appeal for the beach, but, uh, it can certainly be a very nice way to spend the winter. What is a favorite thing of yours to eat? Right now, it's I'm really into Asian food right now, and I know it's a very vague statement, but uh, I guess Thai food specifically, it's, I find yeah. that it's extremely flavorful and lots of vegetables. 
Yeah. Uh, which is which is what I'm craving right now. That's awesome. If I, if I whenever I make food or go out, I prefer to go to Asian specifically Thai restaurants. That's awesome. And you know what I love about Thai food and Asian food is how it's just – it's spanned the globe. Like you truly can find a really good – at least a reasonably good Thai restaurant in just about anywhere. I've, I was in – I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I found a good Thai <laughs> restaurant there. So if I can find it at Fort Wayne, you can find it. So yeah, I'm a lover of Thai food. What about the other way, Marcus? What is something you were forced to eat growing up, but you hated as a kid? I don't think, I wasn't forced from home to eat this, but at school every once in a while. So in, in Sweden, you get school lunch, uh, after okay. lunch yeah. every day. But fairly often, well, it seemed fairly often to me as a kid, we were fed blood pudding which I don't know what it is, but it's tasted about as terrible as it sounds. <laughs> Certainly not very marketed, marketed very well with the title. <laughs> no, and I could not muster to eat it. And I still can't. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I can understand. That's not one that you've grown to love, you're saying? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Never made, never made the chest station towards liking it. Well, then we'll get back to just thinking about Thai food when we think about food. No more blood pudding. What is, it's time to leave the lounge, unfortunately, one travel item, not including your phone, not including your passport, that you will not leave home without? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my running clothes slash running shoes, right? So it's not an item, but I'm bundling this together. Yeah. So when I'm somewhere new, or even someplace I've been, but just not at home, I love to bring my, my running clothes to go exploring in the morning to see as much as possible. Marcus, I like that. And it's interesting. There was a, an era of CX Passport where several guests in a row talked about their fitness clothes or their shoes mm -hmm. or something like that. Excuse me. And I haven't heard that recently. I'm glad you're bringing that back because there's almost no better way to explore a destination than on foot. And right. running is a great way to almost detouristize yourself. Oh, there's a weird word. Is is you're out there in the community, and folks almost may not even see you as a tourist. You're just another person getting your fitness in in the morning. And so right. I, I I too love that as a travel item. We I, I brought my running clothes to London this summer, and it was incredible for this for the reason of that. Right, you could stop anywhere and just take a detour. Yeah. Um, you saw things at a fairly fast pace, faster than walking, but it's not as yeah. fast as when you're on a bus or on a bike. So I, I would love to stay here, but there's some more information. I, like I yeah. want to get more insights out of you before we run out of time here. <laughs> Something because I know you've had this exposure across a lot of different companies and we talked about different silos and how that can be detrimental to the customer experience, right? That's an obvious statement. What's not obvious is, okay, how do we break that down? How do we make sure that customer experience is something that is appreciated and used and as a focus point across the entire company as opposed to, yeah, it's just something that team over there does. <laughs> so if we're lucky enough, it's a company, it's part of the company strategy and mm -hmm. the, the executives are talking about it at all hands meetings and so on and talking, writing about it in the annual reports. We can't affect that. So if that's not happening, I've found that we just need to, well, two things. One, we talked about this earlier, right? Trying to attach what we do to financial outcomes. Yeah. If we can show that we're having an impact on retention by this much, or we are bringing in this much money from new customers or, you know, existing customers, right? That gets the attention of other yeah. teams and other <laughs> departments that they want to be part of what we're doing. And the second thing, if that's just not feasible at the moment, you try to attach yourself to the hot thing that the company's talking about. If they're talking about, oh, I don't yeah. know what that could be, but if there's a topic or strategy that the company is focused on, try to attach yourself to that. That... You, you, you can see it in my face. You can hear it in, in the pause. That's an interesting twist on it because it, tying to ROI, right? There's a lot of us that are out there saying it, and it, it is certainly a bit of a no-brainer, even though it seems like it wasn't a no-brainer for many years. But mm -hmm. now it is absolutely in vogue, and it's not just in vogue. It's the right thing to do. There's a, there's a cynicism that could come into, oh, just tie it to the next hot thing. Actually, though... As you say it, I don't see it as sort of a calculated thing. It's actually a very wise thing. It's the same reason that a video trends on YouTube. It's somebody that has figured out what is the topic that is relevant to somebody, almost in a way of saying, hey, my customer is the rest of the company. What's important to them? 
And how can I tie customer experience to what's important to them? Have you seen that sort of trend approach? I realize I may be distilling what you said there in kind of a, a word, but that trendy <laughs> approach in practice. I've, I don't know if I've, I've, I mean, I've seen it. I, I see it currently, but that's because we're fortunate enough to have the C-suite talk about customer centricity, which is okay. so close to what we're doing that we don't even have to you know, work to make that connection. It's what yeah. we're doing. Um, but I don't know if I've necessarily seen it um, where companies themselves have had to attach themselves to certain issues, at least not that I can remember, but I, um, well, what I like about that though, is that just like you were talking about how Sweden, there's the opportunity, you know, for customer experience that it's not quite what it is. That mm -hmm. just means it's fertile ground, right? Our listeners, viewers, this idea of Marcus, I got right here. Well, you know what? There's fertile ground. If there's not a lot of examples out there, go out there and seize that. What is the hot topic in your company right now? And make sure that the CX initiatives that you're working on are tied to that. Marcus, it, I would be remiss if I left this discussion without talking about something that I mentioned in the intro, because I believe, may not be sure, I believe you may be my first guest that has Arctic warfare training in your background. I realize that's in the past. It probably doesn't come to mind each day for you. But when you think back to that time, how does that relate? And how have you used the lessons of that past in what you do today? So I think my the, the biggest lesson that I take with me from that is there's always more energy left. I can always do more, right? So we, our training was based on being up by the Arctic in a war scenario. We would be behind enemy lines, gathering surveillance on the enemy and doing sabotage, which meant that we did small raids, very small groups, middle of the night in very cold temperatures. And we only had uh -huh. ourselves and our skis and our backpacks. So I think the number one thing that I take with me from my military experience was that uh, I can always, like I can push myself much harder than I think. So when, when I'm tired, if it's late, if there's deadlines, I know that I can push through yeah. uh, and deliver because I'm sitting indoors in a nice office. The lights are on. Uh, <laughs> a little I, different than what you had before. Right. I don't have to heat my own food and like freeze dried food and, you know, minus 30. <laughs> so life is good compared to what it could be. Um, so I can just suck it up and muster through really any, any type of scenario. Okay, right there. That's exactly the lesson. If you listeners, travelers, viewers, if you heard nothing of customer experience or Sweden talk right now, learn from that as you're probably you're like me, you listen to podcasts while you're running outside in good weather, or maybe you're sitting at your desk, realize, yeah, you've got more energy than you realize, because it's probably a lot more comfortable than what it could be sitting out in a snowdrift somewhere in a, in a remote forest, heating your food over a, 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 hopefully heating your food. I'm sure sometimes you didn't even get to do that. So Marcus, I'm glad that we had that opportunity to talk about that. Marcus, I, I, we're running a little bit short on time here, but I wanted to just ask you a general question. You know, consulting is one of those things that gets talked about in general, sometimes in the positive, sometimes in the negative. Those of us, like I've been doing consulting for decades, you're in this space now. What is it about consulting that you truly deeply enjoy? So as I've, as I've stepped away, not stepped away, as I'm not doing consulting anymore, the thing that I really miss is being able to spend, dedicate all my time on specific projects. Because when you're yeah. in line role, in the line organization, you have so many ongoing responsibilities that it's really hard to pivot and focus on a project and be really all in on that project. But when you're a consultant, all you're doing is projects. And so yeah. I, I love and miss being able to, you know, get jump into a project, and that is my whole world. That's all I'm focusing on. There's mm -hmm. no other line items that I'm trying to work on. What line right. items I'm trying to work on? Um, so that's probably the thing. I mean, there's there's the variety that other people talk about. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it, for me, it's dedicating all my efforts on specific projects. There is something incredibly satisfying about that. And I will attest to that as, as someone now, I, I joke that I went into independent consulting so that the only performance appraisal that I ever wrote or received was the invoice that I submit and the payment <laughs> that I receive. So yes, when you talk about the other stuff that comes with, and it's very necessary for a company, but that is something that's very satisfying when it comes to that, hey, I'm going to just focus on doing these projects to deliver that tangible va business value for the client. Marcus, this has been a, a treat to, to get to know you a little bit better, understand your view 
views on customer experience, get a little more knowledge on what it looks like in Sweden. If folks wanted to get to know a little bit more about you, your approach to customer experience and just connect, what would that look like for you? Well, I'm happy to connect over LinkedIn. I think that's probably the easiest way to, uh, to chat about this. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I will get Marcus's link to his LinkedIn, huh, his link to his LinkedIn profile <laughs> uh, and scroll down and you will be able to click to that. Marcus, I've really enjoyed this conversation today. Thank you for being on CX Passport. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. If you liked today's episode, I have three quick next steps for you. Click subscribe on the CX Passport YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. Next, leave a comment below the video or a review in your favorite podcast app so others can find and enjoy CX Passport too. Then head over to cxpassport.com for show notes and resources that can help you create tangible business results by delivering great customer experience. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport.